Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll take a stroll down a Virginia rail walk. We'll check out an N-scale layout in northern Indiana and visit a Philadelphia area garden railroad. But first, let's see how steam trains made their way back into the Iowa landscape at the same time preserving Chinese rail history. Time to get started. Fire and water have powered trains, moved people, and built cities since the early 1800s. Over the last decade, the Iowa Interstate Railroad has brought the sight and sounds of steam back to the Midwest. Robert Fanson, who owns Steam Services of America, manages and maintains these types of locomotives all over the country. The two engines that have made their home in Newton, Iowa, are Chinese immigrants. We have two QJs, the 6988 and the 7081, and they were built in 1985 and 1986. And they were basically a Russian design that was developed from early steam engines from the teens and 20s and 30s. And the American design was, was a design that was for big power, pulling a lot of tonnage. And that's what the QJs are. They're a 2102, a large locomotive for pulling heavy freight trains. So the Chinese went to the Russians and asked the Russians to help them design a locomotive. And they came up with the QJs. And there was 4,700 of those built in China over a period of early 60s all the way up until um, 1998. In 2006, Henry Posner III purchased the QJs, hoping they'd resell to the American tourist railroads. Since there wasn't a market for steam, the QJs became part of Iowa Interstate's corporate identity. In China, there's not a lot of respect for something that's uh, 30 years old because in China, anything less than 1,000 years old is modern. So, so they, they, they do not have the sense of rail history that we have. And it became pretty clear that nobody was really interested in preserving uh, QJ locomotives. So we bought these locomotives and uh, we started running them ourselves. Uh, every year we do something with the locomotives. We've done a lot of benefit trips for fire departments. And of course today we have the NRHS chartering one of the QJs for the uh, Cedar Rapids Convention. The National Railway Historical Society ran two back-to-back -back trips for its members during the summer of 2012. A highlight for the group was being able to watch the Chinese steam in action as it ran between Newton and Rock Island. The thing that's unique about the steam locomotive is, is that it gets its power from coal or oil. You ignite the coal and basically heat the boiler up and the boiler has water in it. It's like a tea kettle. So that firebox heats up that water and then it turns into steam and then steam goes down through a, a series of valves and pistons and basically powers the wheels. And that's where you get the power to you know, pull the trains. But the problem is, is that the steam engine is not very efficient and it takes a lot of maintenance. To be ready for a train trip like this, steam operations need a crew of 20 people. I just run out of here. You're done? Yep. The majority happen to be volunteers who are experienced in running and servicing steam engines. Preparations start four to five weeks ahead of time making sure the locomotive is able to run a few full days and stay tuned up overnight. I'm the coordinator of the night watch crew. And uh, so it gives a continuity, somebody that uh, is, tries to be here every night. And uh, we've been out for six nights now. And they take a lot of service. Uh, more, some more modern locomotives wouldn't take as much uh, physical labor to do the actual servicing with the different lubricants. Right now it's 24 hours a day. We put in 14, the road crew puts in 10. 
on average, sometimes it's more than 14. Along with maintaining the locomotive for seasonal events, Franzen's crew has also spent many hours making sure the QJs pass federal inspection. When we bought the steam locomotives from China, these engines had been operating about 20 years. So we oversaw the rebuild and we did a lot of the um, upgrade work in China to meet our federal standards over here. Once we got the locomotives over here to our shop, we made the further modifications to make them operable here in the United States. You know, add in radios and telemetry devices, speedometers, FRA glazing. We had to work on some of the air brakes and, and those types of things to get them up to snuff here. What's unique about those locomotives is that uh, pretty soon they will be the only QJs running in the world. The locomotive hauling the train today, the 6988, hauled the world's last regularly scheduled mainline steam freight. The 7081, which is the other locomotive that we have, hauled the world's last mainline steam passenger train. So we didn't pick the locomotives based on their history, but we certainly hit the jackpot when it came to world railway history. It's the second generation of steam, where we brought it back in historic preservation and we rebuild it and operate it today. And the reason why we do it is, is because we want our children and our grandchildren to see what built this country. I mean, a steam locomotive is an external machine. You see everything that's going on. You get to hear the chuffing of the exhaust going up the stack, and clickety-clacking going down the rail, and with blowing the whistle. It's an exciting machine for children to know that it was out there and it's still out there. There's people putting big money into having something like this. Coming up, a Philadelphia area arboretum that takes great care in its landscapes as well as its garden railroad. But next, a train enthusiast who runs his own freight system from a spare room in his home. Green hills, coal mines, and storefronts come together to make a lifelike recreation of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. The old railway closed in 1987, but Jeff Ashby keeps the line going with the in-scale trains he's been a fan of since childhood. I got started modeling trains when I was seven years old. My father took off for Vietnam, and uh, he left me a postage stamp train set. It was an engage layout, and it was made out of styrofoam and it had um, a track nailed to it, and um, you could put trees and scenery, dirt and bugs, whatever you wanted on it. <laughs> and I just played with that for hours and hours. 30 years ago, a friend reintroduced Jeff to engage trains, and he's been modeling ever since. The railway runs from Virginia to Indiana and Michigan, and there are plenty of mountain and industrial features to wind through, so Jeff describes his layout as rugged and gritty. If you've ever been to West Virginia, uh, the Appalachians, the, uh, the coal mines in that area, uh, it's a hard life. A lot of people, the, the work that they do is hard there. Jeff constructs most of his layout himself, so he's able to get pretty creative. And even though his layout covers a large area, Jeff still manages to fit a lot in his 9 foot by 15 foot spare bedroom. I, I make all my own track. I build all my own turnouts. I can make whatever configuration I want, whatever size I need, and I can make it fit whatever track plan I needed to fit. That makes the layout unique because I can pack a lot into this tiny little room. I'm not locked into a manufacturer's, uh, their, their standard. I have my own. Originally, when all my coal mines, they uh, would uh, operate live loads of coal. But it's something that I don't 
do in operations anymore because, um, like I say, coal is dirty. And as the coal dust floats through the air, it goes onto the tracks, and that has to be cleaned. And uh, if you don't, um, it doesn't run very smooth. The, the key to, to engage is always keep the track clean. A few years ago, Jeff decided to redesign his layout. He wanted his trains to operate more like the real thing. So Jeff asked a friend with more than 40 years of railroading experience for his operational expertise. My friend Larry Hickman introduced me to some operations that, that the railroad used. He showed me ways the real railroad worked. We have a little thing we call kicking it up against the wall. And what it amounts to is basically he comes up with an idea, he calls me about it, and we kick it back and forth. He just comes up with an idea and says, what do you think? And I put my two cents in, and he finally makes the final decision on what, what he wants to do. Larry helped me with understanding the operations. I didn't have a good understanding of operations early on, and I'm still learning with that. I was able to change the track work and make it work better. And it's Jeff's attention to detail that keeps other operators coming back to his layout. What really surprised me the first time I saw this is how well everything runs. Jeff takes his engines apart even when they're new and rebuilds them from the ground up. So they run flawlessly. When you get behind a throttle and turn it on, that engine just purrs. Still, Jeff's reasons for putting so much work into his layout have just as much to do with friendship. When I think about it, if, if I have this layout and I don't have it to share with anybody, what's it worth? That's the part I enjoy is getting together with people and sharing with them. And they come over and give me their input, their ideas, and when we we talk and we have a camaraderie that you just develop and it's, it's opened up the door for so many new friendships. It's like anything in life, if you don't have it to share with somebody, life would be boring, I think. Some of Jeff's models may be smaller than a pencil, but don't be fooled. Between modeling new track, operating with friends, and dreaming up new designs for his layout, Jeff has his hands full but he wouldn't have it any other way, and neither would we. That's a wrap. As they enter the garden, it is a rolling uh, exhibit. It's you're walking among hills and the trains run up on either side of you. This is the Garden Railway, one of many gardens located in the Morris Arboretum of the University of Pennsylvania. Located in Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia, this arboretum consists of 92 acres of plants, trees, flowers, and trains. Horticulturist Iana Turner said so many of the garden railways that are done now are very flat, but this exhibit is interesting because of the way it is laid out. Part of the magic of this exhibit as the trains appear and disappear around curves in the track, and it, it, it's much more mysterious in the exhibit. This railway garden was originally a Heath and Heather garden. The railway started with three tracks, three train loops, and a trolley line. There are now 16 trains running at all times. Ten of them are loops, uh, large loops. It's going in a circle. And then we have some that are on reverse lines, which we call our trolley lines. We have 10 of those, so there are 16 trains all together. The garden has over about 200 feet, more than a quarter mile, about 1,400 feet of track. And it is a challenge to keep them clean. 
Bruce Morrell, train master at the Arboretum, fell in love with trains when he was a boy. Stripping a gear. We have a variety of trains, diesel, steam, and uh, toy trains that are representative of uh, Thomas type tra toy trains. He displays and runs a variety of trains throughout the day and from week to week, and that keeps the exhibit interesting. We have uh, a lot of aristocraft uh, locomotives because they seem to uh, give me the best longevity for the dollar, uh, and they're easy to repair. We have LGB as well, some um, of the older variety and some of the newer, newer, uh, more recent manufacturer. And the problem with LGB is it's hard to get parts for them. So to keep them going is difficult. That's why we like the Aristocrat because the parts are usually available and are easy to repair. We use a lot of companies that are also here in the, started here in the States. Uh, I use Bachman, big manufacturers here. But the, uh, one of the interesting things is we're G scale, which means we can run outdoors. You see a lot of other scales, but this is a lot more fun. Because, and they're much easier to work on because they're much larger. They make them, uh, the electronics and everything, protected against the weather, so that it's much easier to bring outside. We have little flaws every once in a while, but in general, we can run them snow or rain, ice, we run them. The Garden Railway exhibit is forever evolving, with the theme changing yearly, along with the layouts. We bring in around 14 different buildings. This year, it's Storytale Rail, Humpty Dumpty and uh, Rapunzel's house, the old woman that lived in a shoe. What makes these buildings so magical is the fact they're made out of all natural materials, bark, uh, different pieces of pine cone, you know, twisted uh, limbs off trees, and it just makes it much more magical because there's imagination in the buildings too. There are some structures on the layout that are a constant and don't change. They are just moved around. We have a lot of the inner city Philadelphia buildings, uh, our Independence Mall, a lot of in, uh, our Independence Hall, and a lot of the other things that are very important here. If I move them around all the time, it makes it a lot more fun because sometimes people won't have noticed it the previous year and it looks like a brand new home. We have set up a children's area, particularly where we run Thomas trains primarily. Uh, no matter how much you, you feel, how you feel about Thomas, there isn't a two-year-old and up that doesn't know the Thomas and all the engines. I just enjoy the, their love of the trains, how they get so excited. I mean, some of them do jigs, some of them run around here, hither and yon, chasing one. First year that the trains opened, we were a sleepy, quiet little garden, and we've grown with other exhibits. But this was one of the first exhibits that really uh, started to put us on the map. In the first year, we had 800 new memberships. So trains in the garden has become a very popular uh, thing in the country as a whole, and we were one of the first gardens to bring them outside. Another outdoor experience worth visiting is located in the rail town of Roanoke, Virginia, and I mean the rail town. Local history and generosity combined to create a one-of-a-kind rail walk. Since the late 1800s, railroading has not only defined Roanoke, Virginia as a rail town, but according to area historians and folks with steam in their blood, the rail town. Rail here is pretty fascinating. It came west and was basically passing through in order to go to the coal fields. And the coal fields was where all the product was and all that went back to Norfolk to be put on ships. So Roanoke was kind of in the middle of that. Everything that the city became uh, was because of the railroad. 
rail first came to this area before the Civil War with a line built by the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, but Roanoke really became a city when the Shenandoah Valley Railroad came down the Shenandoah Valley and decided to build a junction here with the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, and they formed what became the Norfolk and Western Railroad. Rail lines naturally became the transportation of choice for delivering coal to power-hungry cities. One of those lines, the Virginian, not only delivered coal and other natural resource products, it was a pioneer in track engineering, corporate efficiency, and rail technology. The Virginian Railway was built rather late as, as compared to most railroads. It was built at the beginning of the 20th century. It was built with the highest technology used to, to, to have the lowest grades. And, uh, the, they basically hauled coal from West Virginia to, to the eastern seaboard. And so they did that more efficiently than any other railroad in the country. Now, not many people know of the Virginian Railway because it was merged into the Norfolk and Western in uh, 1959. Uh, but uh, as old timers do, and we want to make sure others know its story as well. It is quite clear that railroading built Roanoke. The evidence is nearly everywhere one looks in this mid-Atlantic city of over 300,000 residents. Hotels such as the Hotel Roanoke, the restoration project to reclaim the majesty of the Virginian Railway Passenger Station, the Virginia Museum of Transportation, and the O. Winston Link Museum are but a few well-known landmarks that remind visitors and residents alike that Roanoke was instrumental in the development of rail travel and transportation in the United States. I think preserving rail history is important because a lot of the world that we live in today uh, came about because of the, the railroad and uh, the things that we take for granted today didn't exist before the construction of the railroad. The city decided that they needed to honor Virginia's rail heritage and this was a great way to do so. The David R. and Susan S. Good Railwalk tells the story, points to the historic structures of Roanoke, and lets kids of all ages enjoy the sights and sounds of the railroad in the city where railroading was perfected. I see, I see cars. I see cars? What else do you see? Uh, station. Okay. Mr. Goo grew up in Vinton, Virginia, which is just on the other side of Roanoke, and he became the chairman of the Norfolk Southern Railway, and he actually had a large impact on the growth of Roanoke during that time, and so the railwalk was named after him. The rail walk goes between here and the art museum and it literally tells uh, in a chronological way, in some ways, uh, the history of rail in Roanoke. Look how cool this is. Is this like a train? It has uh, interactive displays and literally it helps them understand the heritage of the Roanoke Valley and Western Virginia. This is amazing! The roughly one-third of a mile stretch connects the Virginia Museum of Transportation with the O. Winston Link Museum. Railroad artifacts, interactive exhibits, and educational markers along the way entertain and inform visitors as they make the easy trek through a historic railroad corridor. On the walk is a lot of fun. They can see panels that actually describe and educate about the history of the railroad in Roanoke, but there's also a lot of interactive exhibits. They can ring bells and sound whistles and put down crossing gates and just learn about the railroad. And it's a lot of fun. They get to see a flat car up close. And while they're on the rail walk, real trains are coming by it because it's the main line of the Norfolk Southern Railway. With over 50,000 visitors a year from 59 countries, ranging in age from 3 to 93, the rail walk offers sites ranging from an O-gauge layout in the Transportation Museum to a rail gallery and a rail collection along the way. And of course, like any great interactive museum, buttons to push galore. The museum offers something for everyone. We connect generations in ways. And they're coming to see what Norfolk and Western actually did. The, the rail walk ties together a number of historical aspects of the, the rail history in Roanoke. Uh, you have the uh, old passenger station, which now houses the Old Winston Link Museum. You have the Hotel Roanoke, which was built and uh, operated by the, the, the railroad in the past. And also you have the uh, old uh, freight station, which now houses the Virginia Museum of Transportation. And these are all tied together by the Roanoke Rail Walk. So the railroad was the catalyst behind this city as it is today. Um, I think a lot of visitors think of present day. They don't realize how important the railroad was 
in the past. We were pretty much far out in the country until the railroad came, and there really wasn't a large city anywhere in Western Virginia. So it changed everything, not only about our past, but it changed so that our future's different. The Good Rail Walk in Roanoke, Virginia. A calming stroll through a historic slice of railroading. With an appreciation for what this rail town, the rail town, has become. We want them to come away understanding that the rail heritage here in Roanoke is still vibrant and alive today. And we also want them to know what railroads and transportation in general did for the economic growth of our country. The corridor connects two well-known rail-themed museums and makes for a fine stroll through rail history. Well, that's all for this episode. Please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead.